Hi friends and thank you so much for receiving the news of uh, us going to uh, uh, Fellowship Dubai. Uh, it's been a tremendously difficult time for us as we've journeyed through it. Really appreciated your uh, care, your love. Uh, your, it's been a mixture of grief uh, and uh, and excitement for you know kingdom opportunities and so forth. And so depending on who you are and where you're at and how well you know us, it kind of varies because uh, we're all on a different point in that. But nevertheless, uh, it, it's been a difficult time. And we really, really appreciated your sympathy, love, support and prayers. Uh, I do want to also say a big thanks. So uh, we're almost cracked the 70%. I just need a number of you to get on board with the pledging so we can get over that 70% hurdle. But I do want to say a big thanks to those of you who are you know, committing to the plans for next year. Because remember, the kingdom of God is bigger than MBM and it's not tied to any one person. Well, Acts 17, that's where we're up to. Now, we all know that Christianity has a, is becoming a shrinking voice in the Western world, certainly in Australia. Since about the 60s and the sexual revolution, we've gone from quaint to irrelevant to the enemy. Um, you know, a growing hostility towards biblical Christianity has been our common experience, so much so that we kind of find ourselves now on the wrong side of history, or that's how we're portrayed. And I think Tim Keller was probably right when he said that for the first time, the modern secular West doesn't see itself as a culture anymore. It sees itself as simply right and everyone else is wrong. And that's shifted the game a whole lot. In the public square, uh, to quote another, Oz Guinness, it's ABC, anything but Christianity. And so as we think about, um, as we think about the Great Commission uh, to go and make disciples of all nations, it's very easy to get intimidated. It's very easy to get overwhelmed. It's very easy to become pessimistic. Uh, and so the challenge for us as we think about wanting to share the good news of Jesus uh, for the nations is, is to actually find our grounding again. And to kind of stop us from kind of being intimidated and overwhelmed. And I think Paul's sermon to the Athenians is a crackerjack of a sermon that speaks to all of us. I mean, it is full-blown uh, non-Christian context, non-Jewish context, right? Uh, so the Apostle Paul's on the back end of his second missionary journey in Athens. This is no Kentucky tour through the Greek islands. Uh, he's waiting for his co-workers to join him, Silas and Timothy. And as he's waiting, he's walking around this city. He's probably never been there before. A city filled with extremely impressive history and culture. And it's interesting that it's not a curiosity observation that we notice, but a deep distress. The language is strong. Why? Because Athens was a veritable forest of idols. I mean, they had mastered the art of idolatry. And why is Paul so distressed? Well, for one very simple reason. He knows the Ten Commandments. He sees the world through God's eyes. He knows he basically is feeling a jealousy for God's glory that's been stolen from him, from God. They, that is to say, the idolatry there betrays the fact that they have exchanged the the truth of God for a lie. They're worshipping, uh, rather, they've turned the living and speaking God into a lifeless image that needs to be carried. Uh, and and it's, and Paul is feeling the grief of that. Uh, oh, that we would start our Jesus conversations with a passion before even another person's salvation, actually a passion for God and his glory. That's a good place to start. Well, before long, Paul is invited to speak at the Areopagus, pronounced by different people in different ways, Mars Hill. This is kind of infotainment at its best and worst. I'll leave you, leave you to work out which one. There were two philosophical schools represented, the Epicureans and the Stoics. And uh, and Luke makes a lovely little sort of sarcastic comment. You know, they didn't so much love the truth. They just love new ideas. You know, they're into novelty. Now, at one level, what we got here is Paul, a child of Abraham, a Jew, speaking to people from other cultures, faiths, and belief systems. And you think about it, you think, wow, that's our world. It's a very multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-faith world. Uh, and uh, as Paul speaks, you notice the way he engages in a conversation. Very respectful. He notes they're very religious, very inclusive. We ought not think rather than you ought not think. Uh, he begins where they're at very good kind of missional uh, contextual speaking. And uh, he notices a, a altar to an unknown God and, uh, and figures that's a good place to start. Let me tell you about the God that you claim you don't know. Uh, and it was functioning in each way bet. You know, when you worship that many gods, the chances are there's probably another one you're missing. So they just, you know, covering their, their back and covering their bets by having this particular altar. And, uh, and, uh, and there, there through this conversation, Paul very inclusive to, at the end of the day, 
with the goal of presenting the exclusive claims of Christ. Now, it's important to hear this. I'll tell you why. Because in our postmodern secular age, we uh, are told that uh, you don't really have the right to tell anyone about what they should believe. You know, just back off, everyone. Everyone kind of backs off, which I actually don't think it's a healthy society anyway. I think the mark of a mature society, we can have lovely, robust debates and respect each other, even in the differences. Um, uh, but, you know, we're often accused of being paternalistic and, and uh, disrespectful if we're sharing our beliefs in the context of, uh, uh, of uh, our view of Jesus. Uh, I, I think of uh, uh, someone who I mentioned not that long ago, John and Betty Sharp. They were actually working amongst the Tagutal people in the jungles of Indonesia. And they, they got to see 70%, 75% of that of the, of the people group actually be, turn and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And interestingly, an American anthropologist came into the community. I've shared this story before. He came into the community, and as he got to know the community, he said, you know, there are people from my country, e.g. the United States, who believe that what John and Betty did by coming here and sharing Jesus with you was very wrong, very disrespectful. Anyway, one of the Tagudo people stood up. He was really upset with them. He said, you go and tell those people from your country what it was like here before John and Betty came in Jesus, how we lived in, we were, lived in slavery to fear of ancestors and spirits and, uh, and uh, practices that were just so cruel and vicious and mean. No, you go and tell them what it was like before they brought Jesus to us. And I thought that was lovely. Well, what Paul does is he draws a circle around what they and he all have in common. Uh, and uh, it's a series of ones. Uh, one creator is what they share in common, firstly. Let's put, let, pick it up at verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. So you can see what Paul is doing. He's placing all humans, Athenian culture, Jewish culture, every one of us under the one God who created the heavens and the earth and everything in it. That is to say, we all share the one creator. Uh, and uh, this was pretty much the opposite to how the way the Epicureans and Stoics thought, because like perhaps modern day Australians, they actually believe that the world came into existence simply by random chance, a series of flukes. So Paul draws this circle around all humanity and uh, making the point we've all been created by the one God. That is to say, uh, we don't make space for God, e.g. temples. God made space for us, the earth. That we don't make him in our image. No, we have been made in his image. Um, that every nation, language and tribe has this one clear truth that they share. And that is, we are all equally dependent on this one God for existence. That he is not dependent on us we are dependent on him. He carries us, we don't carry him. And, uh, and Paul quotes uh, one of the poets uh, who uh, wrote a hymn to Zeus, would you believe, and pulls it out and says, you know, on this point, actually it's true. And that is, and the quote is, in him we live and move and have our being. Our very existence, doesn't matter who you are, whatever tribe, clan or person you come from, we're all utterly dependent on God. And, um, and he's really making, he's getting to the point where he's trying to show the bankruptcy of, uh, the spiritual bankruptcy of idolatry. That these gods need to serve them rather than the other way around. Idolatry always puts uh, the gods at the mercy of humans instead of humans at the mercy of, of God. Um, and as I said, we don't carry God, he carries us. But with idolatry, you see, it's the other, it, it flips. And actually, the gods are dependent on us. One God. We share that in common. Secondly, one ancestor. Verse 26. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. Well, clearly Paul believes in a historic Adam. I think that's evident there. Go back far enough. We're all related. So, so I'm looking at you through the camera, obviously. And what do I see? Cousins, that's what you are. I've got a cousin who I just spoke to the other day. She always opens a comment. Cousin, great to see you. Well, we're cousins. We're cousins virtue of being children of Adam. Now, of course, we're brother and sister in Christ because virtue by virtue of the blood of Jesus and the Spirit of God. And Adam, well, he's as much the granddaddy of the Aborigines years of the Turk. We're all bound together. Uh, I was talking to one proud Assyrian who will remain nameless from church, and uh, he was so disappointed he did a DNA test and discovered he was only 35% uh, Middle Eastern. I'm thinking to myself, bro, I'm I'm 27% Arabic, man. I'm nearly I'm nearly as Middle Eastern as you are. Um, 
But I said to him, but you know, you are, I know you thought you were a thoroughbred Middle Easterner, but I know this, bro, you are 100% human because you were a child of Abraham, a uh, child of Adam. Um, I've got a friend of mine, when she, whenever she was pregnant, uh, people always ask her the standard question, oh, what are you, what are you hoping for? And she would say, a human. Because <laughs> it's a human every time. Because <laughs> we're all children of Abraham. One God, one ancestor. And of course, what this does, of course, is remind us yet again of the sheer stupidity and folly of racism, doesn't it? Um, whether it's institutional racism or personal racism, it still cuts, it's still cruel, and it's still a sin we need to repent of. And so can I just say, constantly examine your heart when it comes to the sin of racism, because it's always lurking there. And it's such a denial of the fact that there's one God who created us all, and that we all descend from the one man, Adam. Uh, the question for us always is, will we, or will, will we always fully embrace the humanity of every person we're in front of? That's the challenge. One God, one ancestor, and one purpose in God's providence. One purpose in God's providence. That God is clearly in charge of the rise, uh, spread, and fall of every culture and nation. Look at verse 26. From one man he made all the nations so that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. Ah, so it's God who determined when the Athenian culture would flourish and when it would begin to die off, as it was by this stage. It is God who decided when the Russian Revolution would begin and when the Soviet Union would be dismantled. He's sovereignly operating through all of human history. God is the reason why one out of every four babies are Chinese. That's right, you never know what you're going to get. <laughs> uh, it was God who uh, determined uh, who and how many migrants would come to this land. You see, you know, during the uh, 50s and 60s, the Menzies government was in our parliaments thinking about how to bring migrants over to this land for factory fodder and how to build some of the, the Snowy Mountain Scheme and stuff. You know, whatever plans they were thinking, God had other agendas on his mind. Um, uh, God was behind you or your father or your great-great-great-great-grandfather coming to this land, whether, whether it was 50,000 years ago, as in the case of the First Nations people, or whether it was just five days ago. Now, by the way, that's not to deny the injustice of land taken from First Nations people. That's another distinct and important question. And so with one purpose uh, in mind, uh, what is that purpose if God's overriding all of human history? Look at verse 27. God did this, remember, determining the times and places where nations operate. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. So God's hand involved in every aspect of human culture and life has one outcome in mind, that one divine outcome. I mean, there may be others, but this is the one that God has front and center in this verse, and it's this, that people would reach out for him and find him. Now, there is a sense where you've, you've got the kind of groping in the dark trying to reach out for him, but, but, the, but the purpose is driven by salvation. That is to say, all of human history is salvation history. All of human history is salvation history. Now, I don't know how that plays out in detail all the time, but I do know this. When God humbles humanity and dislodges people groups, they do tend to be a bit more open to the good news of Jesus Christ. At a pure observational level, I've seen that. Uh, in fact, it's interesting, you know, it, that as you plot the, the, the spread of migration, even to our own country here in Australia, uh, that that's exactly what's taken place. But it's good to actually think theologically about migration um, in these contexts. Whether your grandparents, or like my parents, came after World War II, actually, my father came in 1939 from Malta, uh, along with three million other people from the 40s, 50s and 60s from Europe into this land. In the 70s, we had 120,000 Asians, particularly from Southeast Asia. Uh, in the 70s, we had 20,000 uh, Lebanese uh, from the Lebanese Civil War come to Australia. And we had a whole tens of thousands of political asylum seekers from South America in a series of dictatorships there that where people were seeking asylum. In the 80s, we had Chinese students whom the Prime Minister at the time allowed to stay in the country because of the uh, Tiananmen Square massacre. In the 90s, we had the Yugoslav wars in, in the Balkans uh, and a whole lot coming during that period. And then more recently, we had the Sudanese civil war and the, and the ISIS and the Syrian crisis that has brought... In fact, we've got a Syrian refugee, as I'm filming now, and we, we have a Syrian food ministry where they're loading up food for some of the refugees from the Syrian crisis. God has brought the world 
into our backyard so that would re- so that they would reach out for him and find him. You know, in our vision and mission statement extended one, I wrote these words many years ago to, in 2005. God in his sovereign control of history has brought the nations into our backyard. I'm thinking they're the west of Sydney. We refuse to let this wonderful opportunity slip through our hands. God desires all people to be saved, and so do we. See, why is it that you, why is it, that you think you're living in Australia? Or why is it that your parents or grandparents came to Australia? For a better life? Yeah, not, well, yes, but something more importantly, not a better life, eternal life. That's the reason why you've come so that you can hear of the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, that's not limited to Australia. That's happening all over the world where God is moving people so that they would reach out for him and find him. And yes, um, we can speak to every culture because every person from every culture will stand before the one judge, one creator, one judge, one person, one purpose and providence and one judge of whom we will all stand before. Let's look at verse 31. For he, God, has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. So God clearly has no cultural favourites. It's not like some will stand before the judgment seat of God and others won't. Every human being, and that's why everyone's validated in the process, and that's why every person has meaning, because everyone is called to give an account of the choices they have made in their life before one person, one judge, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Um, no one no one gets to exempt themselves. No one gets to say, well, I don't, I don't have to worry because I'm an Australian Anglican or I'm an American Baptist or I'm a Chinese Buddhist or I'm an Indian Hindu. Now, every human um, on this earth will stand before Jesus Christ and that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And that it, hasn't, that it hasn't happened already is simply the mercy of God allowing people time. That's the reason why Jesus hasn't come back, in case you've wondered. <laughs> it's been 2,000 years, and you know I'm thankful that he's delayed 2,000 years. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been born, and he wouldn't, I wouldn't have been allowed the first 20 years of my life to go on in a state of rebellion. His delay is a mark of kindness so that we would repent. Um, and, he has, uh, and he has overlooked our rebellion in the past, but now that Jesus has come, things have changed. This is the great game changer, verse 30. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, okay? So he recognized that. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. There it is. And that's the, the next one thing, the one command to repent. God commands all people everywhere to repent, to turn from idols to trust Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Now, by repentance, let me explain what it is, what it is. Repentance is not just remorse. You know, you can feel sorry for things you've done and not turn to Jesus. Repentance isn't simply reform. A lot of people who had uh, uh, alcohol issues have stopped drinking, but haven't necessarily turned to Jesus. You can reform your life without Jesus. No, repentance is about turning from sin and turning to Jesus as your Lord and Saviour. From running a me-run life to running a Jesus run life. Um, Repentance is functionally about having Jesus the main character of your life, really. That's one way. Uh, Repentance literally means to change one's mind, to take Jesus' view of the world and make it yours, to think his thoughts, to share his affections, to make choices in line with his will. The plea, I I wasn't brought up this way, is irrelevant because now, you know, in the past God overlooked it, but now, we live in the but now time, Uh, We're not victims of our culture. We're not trapped into thinking that I'm a victim of the culture that I was brought up in. Um, God has commanded every individual human to repent wherever they are. All nations, all ages, all classes, all styles, all personalities, all sexual orientations, all faiths, all, all, all religion, all personalities. I mean, pick whatever category you want to divide humanity in. And God is saying no one is exempt from this command. God commands all people everywhere to repent. I was going to go into a children's talk song there. They were restrained from doing it. That you and I are not at the mercy of our upbringing. Um, but for that to happen, we must be given sufficient evidence to actually make a, such a big call. Um, it certainly was the reason why I delayed before I said yes to Jesus. I wanted to know the evidence. And, and uh, the last point is that there is one proof for all people sufficient for you to repent. Uh, verse 31. For he, God, has set a day when he will judge the world with justice 
by the man he has appointed, that's Jesus. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. So as far as God is concerned, there is sufficient evidence for all categories of humans to hear the call to turn and trust Jesus and then to follow through with it. That the resurrection, the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ as presented in the Gospels and eyewitnessed by many different people in different contexts is deemed to be sufficient evidence for you and I to turn from our sins and to put our trust in him. Bertram Russell was a famous atheist philosopher and uh, he he was once asked, Bertrand, uh, what would you say to God on Judgment Day if Christianity proved to be true? It's a good question. It's a hypothetical for him, right? And he thought for a moment and he said, well, you didn't give me enough evidence. That was, his, that was his comeback. But the thing is, we're told here, as far as God is concerned, and remember, he's the judge who will judge with justice and he gets determined what sufficient evidence is. He said, but I did give you. You have no excuse. You can't claim ignorance at this point. I've given you sufficient evidence by the resurrection of my son. Um, the resurrection of Jesus is sufficient proof for all people to repent, regardless of when they live and uh, post-Christ and where they live. Whether you're talking to a Kenyan grandmother, a Colombian farmer, a Thai nurse or a Portuguese chef. Um, God commands all people everywhere to repent. No one is born a Christian. Uh, God has no grandchildren. Uh, you kids and teenagers, that you've got to own Jesus for yourself. Um, you may have taken on the faith of your parents kind of consciously and unconsciously, but there comes a time when you need to own it for yourself. It's absolutely critical you do that. Um, and the result of this great sermon is that, well, some, some became disciples, not like the, you know, the thousands at Pentecost, the, the three and five thousand that we hear of in Luke. You know, the groundwork hadn't been done here as it had been done in Jerusalem, where Jesus had been preaching with his disciples for three years, hence the great large numbers. Now, this was cold terrain. There were some who accepted and there were some who laughed. And that's pretty much the life of ministry since then. I mean, revivals aside, that's generally what you're going to get. Some who believe, some who will laugh. Uh, I wonder which category you fall in. Are you a follower or do you think of Jesus as fo sheer folly? Which is it? A follower? or you think of it as sheer folly. You know, the tendency today is to so focus on our cultural differences, which are real and often to be celebrated. I love cultural diversity. That's what I love about church. There's so many different cultures. But, but what we need to remember is every human culture means that we have far more in common than we have difference. And it's very easy to forget that because at a superficial level, we are so different. Music, style, dress, codes, uh, mannerisms, etc., but what we're told here is every human, every child of Adam has one God they share in common, one ancestor, one judge whom they will stand before, one, one purpose in providence to reach out for him, one command to, to repent, and one piece of evidence that God has raised his son from the dead and he will be the judge upon whom every one of us will stand before. And that's why, friends, when God speaks to Athenians 2,000 years ago, and you may think, what's it got to do with me? You know, they lived before the microwave, the, the micro machines and the microchip. You know, we're modern people. <laughs> Irrelevant. Because all those categories are exactly the same 2,000 years later in the 21st century. Um, we all have to stand before the one judge. We're all created by the one God. Those realities haven't changed. We're all still children of a uh, Adam. Um, no, there is no us and them. That's why, that's why this sermon is so brilliant, because it draws a circle around all of humanity and brings us inside the circle, uh, left with the one response, will we or won't we take up the call of God to command uh, the command to turn and trust him? And that's what we're called to do. Now, you're not called to command people to repent. God is the one who does that. But we take people to Jesus who issues forth that command. Sure, respectfully, um, winsomely, gently, always, always. Um, to do it any other way is to be disrespectful. Uh, to do it coercively is always wrong. But at the end of the day, we're introducing people to Jesus who commands all people everywhere to turn and trust. Because why? Because that's where life is found. Why would you want to rip people off? <laughs> he, he says, I've come that you may have life and have it to the full. Why would you want to keep people who you love, who don't love yet, yet love Jesus from that wonderful truth? And that's what gives us confidence to be able to share the good news of Jesus Christ. 
because we all share the one human culture. One God, one ancestor, will stand before one judge, issue the one command, and given sufficient evidence to bow before him uh, by knowing that he raised his son from the dead because the resurrection is the great game changer. Well, uh, friends, maybe today's the day where you've heard the call perhaps for the first time and want to decide to turn from your sins and put your trust in Jesus Christ who at the cross bore the judgment of your sins so that you may be forgiven and that as surely as Jesus was raised from the dead, so will you be by putting your faith in him. Well, if that's you today, I'm going to invite you to pray this prayer with me. And, uh, and for the rest of us, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a life lived in repentance. And part of that is sharing the good news and announcing to the world that God has commanded all people everywhere to repent. And what I love about Acts, Acts doesn't end on a command. It actually ends on a promise. In Acts 28, 28, we're told in the face of those who rejected the good news of Jesus, that Paul says the message of salvation is going to go to the nations and they will listen, which then means we engage in this awesome mission with optimistic eyes from a, from a posture of confidence because they will listen. So let's, uh, not get out, let's not get in the way of God's great purpose. Let me invite you to pray with me. Oh, dear God, whatever differences there are between us all as humans, you have made us all, you have sustained us all, you have been so patient with us all. Thank you for bringing us to this moment, to this place, so that we may seek out for you and find you. We truly believe, God, that you raised Jesus from the dead. We recognize that is sufficient evidence for every one of us to turn and put our trust in you. And so, Jesus, for some of us right here, right now, we want to surrender to you, the one who was raised from the dead, the one in whom we will stand before on the last day. And we want to submit to you and surrender to you as our Lord, our judge and our saviour. And it's in Jesus' powerful name we pray. Amen. Amen indeed.